everybody. Thanks a lot for coming uh, to this talk. Uh, just as a brief presentation, my name is Thomas. I'm currently the general manager of the Paris Hypercasual Studio. And for the last two, two and a half years, I've also been a publishing manager working at Voodoo. Um, and uh, working on games like uh, Fireballs 3D and Helix Jump uh, in that time. Um, just as a kind of, oh, no, sorry. Just as a brief um, introduction, um, Voodoo is like pretty well known now as a publisher of hypercasual games. But historically, and um, in our mind, in our culture, we very much identify as game makers, uh, game designers, and developers. And so it's always been very important for us um, to have a strong internal um, development teams and to share that knowledge then that we get from those development teams with our partner studios uh, who make the huge majority of our games. Um, so in the last like two to three years, it's been really quite a crazy time to make hyper-casual games on such a scale. The market has grown uh, more than 50% year on year. Um, and as a studio, that presents incredible opportunities because not only do you have more and more people potentially playing your games uh, every week, every month, every year? But you also have more and more studios coming into the market, uh, sharing knowledge about how they make games, are the publishers that make their games in a way that is different to yours, where you can learn. And so it's been an incredible learning opportunity for us, um, nonstop, basically. What that kind of creates is something a bit special, because the huge market expansion attracts more and more players but also more and more companies to the market, which means, in general, that the competition in the top charts becomes more fierce between publishers, between studios, just in general, there's more games uh, for more players. And what that means, in turn, is that competition moves down from the top charts to even on the prototyping phase, uh, when you're testing, you know, somebody can have a similar idea, or there could be a game where you miss the opportunity because the market changes very quickly. And that creates a bit of a different situation than we have known for studios, whether that's intern inside Voodoo or uh, our partners, is that there's always been one very normal truth in hypercasual where we develop very, very fast, is that if you make enough prototypes, if you test enough ideas, if you try enough concepts, you should find one that is promising. You should find a game that shows promise that was going to have good marketability or high retention, something that you can use to scale and get many users. However, now, that's still true, but you also have to accept this. That if you take too long with your game, if you're not focused enough on your idea, you could miss your shot with a prototype and somebody else could have the big hit of the moment on the App Store. So how do you make these two coexist? That's kind of the subject I want to talk about today, and that's what I mean by a probability market in the presentation. It means that at some point in the next two months, three months, four months, there's going to be one, two, or three huge hyper-casual games on the market. As a publisher, as a studio, our goal is to make sure that we make that huge game and that we have the tools and we give the tools to the studios we work with to make those huge games. Um, so I'm going to talk about three kind of core learnings that we've had as an internal production team and that we've shared with uh, the studios we work with. Um, at the end, I'm just going to briefly explain like a, a template uh, prototyping cycle that we have inside the studios. And I guess we'll have time, hopefully, for a few questions at the end if you guys have any. So the first major learning is you want to make a game, you're working in hyper-casual, you want to explore the market, what kind of idea do you start from? That's always the core concept. When I work with studios and developers, I always say that short development takes a week, but it's six months to find the correct idea. So the learning is that we really encourage people to innovate all the time. In all our communication, in all the live streams that we do, in all the documents that we have, we tell people that they have to be very innovative. But innovation doesn't necessarily mean, in hyper-casual, reinventing the wheel every time you make a game. You have to do something which is new, but also something that is familiar for players with settings, ob objectives that they will recognize. Um, you have to do something just that they haven't seen in a while. And a, what I think is a good example of this is these two games. So on the left, Helix Jump, which was one of our huge successes in 2018, at the time it was very new. You control the environment and not the avatar for hypercasual that was new. It was level based. There was a good perfect system. All that was kind of new at the market at the time. But it's not entirely new. You basically have exactly the same objectives as a game like Rolly Vortex um, that was made a year before. And just to say, uh, so Helix Jump was made by uh, Hate Game Studios, who are based in the Ukraine, and Rolly Vortex by BDJ Studios, who is another one of our oldest partners, who is based in India. So. Helix Jump is innovative for its time, but it's not completely reinventing the wheel. You, essentially, you have the same feeling, the same type of movement. You just switch over 
the type of control, the type of interaction that you have, and you have something with, that the market will consider as being completely innovative. So once you have an idea, and it's not easy, but once you have an idea that will be considered innovative on the market, you have to start building your toy, building your prototype, and then you have to start testing. Hypercasual is based entirely on testing prototypes, get early metrics, know where to invest your time, know when to invest your development uh, power. So the second learning that I want to share with you is you should test fast all the time. The market moves incredibly fast. There's trends every two months. However, testing too fast is also very dangerous. We really try to focus on high quality games, uh, hyper casual. So obviously that's not the definition everybody has. For us, it's a really good core loop, a really good feeling, something very clear, very precise, and not really on KPIs. Testing a prototype that doesn't really verify your gameplay is kind of pointless. And to explain what I mean, I'm going to give you the example of Paper 1 and Paper 2. Uh, the two games were made by our Montpellier studio, uh, who is an internal development team that has been with us for three years. Paper 1 was made in one week, very quickly. And the guys basically just, it was a te technically very easy. They could get the feeling that they wanted, the vision that they wanted for the game in one week. They tested it, great stats, the game was published, and was a huge success. However, about one year, one year and a half later, they wanted to start working on Paper 2. They had the idea for the game, which would be 3D, free-flowing, more adapted to the common market, so more innovative, but also using previously learned mechanics and systems that players would recognize. That game was made in four months. For a hyper-casual game, it's extremely long. But they had the vision for it, and they wanted to test it cleanly with the right mechanic, the right movement, no bugs, because they knew that that core gameplay, that one game, would be the center for the whole retention, the whole CPI of the game. So here you have the two, two examples. Sometimes it's okay to test fast because your mechanic is clear, it's easy to make, and you can test it in one week. Other times, if you have a very clear vision for a game, it's okay to take a bit more time. So now that you have a great idea, you tested your game, and you're starting to have interesting KPIs, what do you do? Because obviously the market is more and more competitive even at the prototype phase, so chances are you're not going to get some great retention straight off the bat. The next thing we really encourage um, our internal studios and partner studios to be is to be really radical once they have some interesting KPIs. So I know like being radical sounds super pretentious and something that's not clear, um, but actually there's uh, quite a strong basis in testing behind what I mean in that. It means that if you have a great idea and your first test shows it, there could be a much better version of that concept that you haven't yet thought of, that you haven't yet developed, and that will give you a much bigger potential hit game. So I'm going to give you two examples uh, for this. The first one being Hall.io. So it's quite a, we've talked about this quite a lot, but it's quite interesting to see the progress of the game from the original uh, toy, the technical test, to what it was at the end. So this game was developed also by our Montpellier studio, same guys as Paper. Um, and one of the developers there, Michael, made a technical test in a couple of days because he thought it would be fun. He made it, the team played it, they thought it had a good feeling, so they started thinking about a gameplay that they could put on this technical test, on this good feeling, in order to have a good game. What they developed first was a runner version of the game, because everybody develops runner versions of technical tests when they can, it's easy, it's clear, you have normal objectives, you got good, make good movement, fine. They test it and they get like six cents CPI in the US. Incredible potential, but retention is terrible, like 30 day one. Instead of really focusing on that game, they weren't afraid to lose their CPI, and they decided to test four, five, six different, completely different uh, genre of gameplays for that game. So it was late 2017, a different time, and we were still testing idle games at the time, so they made an idle version of the game. It wasn't fun to play, they didn't even test it. That took them two weeks. In another two weeks, they made a puzzle version of the game, kind of a recipe. You have to collect certain things, avoid certain others, it's kind of annoying, kind of laborious to play. They didn't test it. And then, after a month and a half of discussion and testing, Miguel had the idea of doing a .io version of the game. They played it, they thought it was fun, tested it, and we got 60 day one and 25 day seven on the first test, the game was published. So that's kind of what I mean by being radical. You, have, you, sh you cannot be afraid to break open your game, really identify what's fun in it, and transport that, make it into another version of the game, another gameplay, it's completely okay, just as long as you're following through on that core, fun feeling, which is the basis for all hyper-casual games. <coughs> Sorry. It's pretty cold. Um, the next example of this, because this is pretty extreme, right? You're, like, you're testing seven different types of game. Next example, which is quite interesting, it's Aquapark.io. The first version, which was made by Cassette Studios, um, it's 
pretty basic. It's a normal uh, like water slide runner. You bump people off the edge. We've seen this a hundred times. Not that interesting. But they made it in such a way which seemed like it had promising KPIs. Instead of completely breaking open the gameplay because they had relatively interesting retention, relatively interesting CPI, they decided to be super radical in how they would change the gameplay, how they would make it better. So they added the jumping mechanic, which pushed the retention around 50 or just over 50%, really changed the art style to improve visibility and contrast. The game was published, and thanks to a lot of virality, it was a huge success. And also a big thank you to our publishing team that worked very hard on the game uh, for over a month. So this is an example that without completely changing the actual genre of your game, from Runner or .io or Puzzle, etc., you can be super radical in the way you iterate on the same idea, the same gameplay, by really trying to find something which will be much more fun to do once the game is uh, in, in players' hands. Um, so, obviously this process is uh, not an exact science. Um, sometimes you stop halfway, sometimes you have trouble finding a concept. Um, if it was an exact science, we would have all the top spots in the top 10 US App Store, which is not the case. So, just to show you kind of how in internally we use this process, I'm just going to give you a brief example of a testing and prototyping cycle inside the Paris Studio, or at least the way uh, it should be. Um, so at first you have to innovate, which means find a concept. And what that means is, in general, today we think it's quite difficult for a developer alone to be entirely responsible for finding a concept, developing it, having some good ideas about it. So we really encourage discussion within the team, where one developer will come up with an idea, start chatting to another developer of the team, and we have a list of questions um, that we start asking to see if we haven't missed anything in the game. Some very basic stuff, of course, camera control, that kind of thing, but also some more specific things for hypercasual in terms of visual hierarchy, in terms of position of the finger of the screen, if you have the controls, in terms of fluidity, um, all those questions that you need to ask before you even start writing a line of code, because once you start, then you're stuck in your idea and it's very hard to change. Once we have a concept that is validated by the entire team, so that's 12 people, takes a bit of time, we make a first toy of it, the developer, and it's a technical toy like what I showed you about Halt.io. There's no gameplay. It's just the core feeling of the game. It can be a sling, it can be a hole swelling up objects, it can be really anything you want, but it just needs to have that perfect feeling for a good hyper-casual game. Once we have that toy, we have a series of tests that we do internally first. So we go out on the street, we ask 10 people to play the game, don't say anything. If one person doesn't understand, we know that we need to fix something about the controls because people don't get it. Um, we benchmark a lot outside of hypercasual as well. So that's if you're making a parkour game and you're wondering what's cool about parkour, you're going to watch hours of parkour videos, find the right things, um, just to make sure that you're going in the right direction. Once you have something that seems like with your original street test, with your questions that you're asking that seems fair, you start testing to get first KPIs. And that's the moment where sometimes it's a bit of a heartbreak because you get $2 CPI and 20% retention day one, but at least it's a good test. If it's good, then you have two options. Either you find an alternative solutions to the gameplay to completely break it open, or you truly finish the gameplay, go a lot in depth into it, and really try to find a good solution to make the retention go up. Um, as I said, it's not an exact science. It's something that we're working on all the time. We've been very, very lucky to work with uh, hundreds of very talented studios that have taught us this, that we've been able to test this with. Um, and we were hoping that in the next years, we're going to be able to, precise, to make this a lot more precise and to share even more information and even more data with the studios that we work with uh, from those tests that we're making internally. In a lot of ways, the internal studios at Voodoo kind of serve as a laboratory of process, techniques, and questions that we ask uh, for our partner studios. Um, thanks a lot for listening. Um, just before we move to any questions, I just wanted to let you guys know we're always looking for more people to work with, whether that's external studios or if you want to work inside um, our production teams at Voodoo. We've got teams all over Europe now in Berlin, Amsterdam, Barcelona, uh, some really great places with some really talented people. So if uh, you're interested, please don't hesitate to come after the talk and have a chat. Thank you.